Hello, welcome to the Women in Drones webinar. Would you mind finding there should be a question section where you can put a little message in just so that I know the audio is coming through loud and clear. Hello, Trish. Yeah, perfect. All good, fantastic, thank you. Okay, so welcome to Women in Drones. Um, we're going to be flying through this as rapid as possible because we've got a huge panel to discuss all sorts of interesting things so i want to keep it really fast um just a bit of housekeeping when you have a question for anyone in the panel next slide jess please um there should be a little bit where you can add like a chat message um even better if you can put the name of the panelist who you're hoping to answer that question for you if you can put that at the start that would be really really handy for me and jess when we get to the end and uh, next up so a bit about the reason we kind of put this together there's a chap called randall warnus who works for fleur which is a thermal imaging camera company um based in the based in america so they've set up a group which is called unmanned underground it's on facebook i highly recommend you check it out but last year he did like a, a brilliant all-female panel webinar which um caroline bailey was on which was absolutely fantastic um and we kind of thought there's no one really doing anything like that in the uk so why don't we set this up basically and um invite a load of panelists on and see what happens so that's how we've come to this today next please jess so really quickly, a bit about Copters. We are commercial drone experts based in Leeds in the UK. We provide the full solution. So we've got expert drone training. We've got a range of world-class suppliers, which I'll come on to briefly. Um, we do the hardware, payload, software, and we've got a selection of industry specialists based across the full range. So we've had surveying, public safety, uh, inspection, media, um, real estate, military, police, fire, it really is the full solution for all of those sectors. Uh, next please. Um, just a few of our partners on this page, so they're based all around the world. We've got, um, I won't go into it too much, but we have DJI, we've got Flyability based in Switzerland, Pix4D, that's 3D mapping software, um phase one photogrammetric cameras and um, flare that i've spoken about briefly thermal imaging cameras there's a whole range if you go to uh, who we work with on the website you'll be able to find about a bit about all of these individually next please so without further ado i'd like to introduce to our lovely panel starting off with anna gamara from raptor uas anna Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Hayley, for this introduction. And uh, my name is Anna Gamarra. I work uh, in Raptor US. I'm the project manager and also co founder for Raptor US in the UK. And we have Naomi Horner, who's in the uh, Copters training team. Naomi? Hi, yeah, I've uh, been working at Copters for three years, mainly in customer service. Um, but currently moving over to the training team, so getting a lot more involved in that. And uh, we have Caroline Earnshaw from Networks3. She isn't actually Hi, on the, uh, you won't see a webcam, so you'll just hear this audio floating around, so don't be worried. <laughs> Apologies for that, guys. Yeah, so my name's Caroline Earnshaw. I'm Commercial Director at Networks3 and Networks3 Drones. A uh, proud female drone pilot, and it's really a great privilege to be on this with with everybody. So thank you for having me. Thank you, and we have Annabelle Randall from Arcadis. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm, I'm Annabelle, so I work for a company called Arcadis. Um, my job title is a geo environmental consultant slash geologist. Uh, Caroline Bailey from Pictera, formerly Pix4D. Hi Hayley, thanks so much for having me on today. It's a real privilege to be invited. Yeah, I'm Caroline Bailey. I work at Pictera, which is a machine learning software that uses drone photographs in uh, in Switzerland. I'm on, on the sales team, the account executive. Thanks for having me today. A special thank you to Caroline because we actually pre-recorded um, an interview, didn't we? But we decided that the interest was so much, she's 
dropped everything to jump on today from a holiday, so thank you very much. Um, we have Rebecca Jones. Hi, yes, I'm Rebecca Jones, co-founder and owner of iPreserve, and thank you for having me on your panel today, Hayley, and the opportunity. And finally, we have Emily Bratt. Hey, yeah, I'm Emily. I'm from Drone Prep. I'm the Innovation Lead and Community Manager. And in, just in case you don't know what Drone Prep is, it's all about preparing the world for a future of drones. Cool. So without any more um, chat, we'll move straight into the interview. So we'll kick off with Caroline Earnshaw, Networks 3. So Caroline, how are Networks 3 using technology currently and how did you come to start working with copters? Yeah, that's a great question. So Networks 3 predominantly uh, started as a telecommunications company, so we've always been technologically based. Um, Networks 3 Drones was created based on the demand and need of our clients to basically offer a turnkey solution and use drones to ascertain information that isn't so easily obtainable by being feet on the ground, basically. So. As a business, we've evolved the drone side of what we do, and we use the drones in various different sectors to survey and, and to basically report back to our clients. So they have become literally a, a really supporting arm of our business in, in every area of work we cover, right through from renewable energy, um, you know, heritage buildings, uh, cladding inspections, sewer inspections, and right through to flying in churches and, and all sorts of amazing environments, really. So they've very much become part of the business and part of the service we deliver. And can you talk about um, the reason behind sort of adopting the technology? I remember we've had conversations in the past. Um, it's a mixed bag, but safety and protecting the workforce was quite a big um a big deal for networks three yeah definitely i mean that is ultimately our our key aim is to basically protect the safety of our staff and protect the safety of people who are working on sites that we're privileged privileged enough to work on so for example you know we we had an inspection uh, a roof inspection which prevents the necessary necessary sort of scaffolding being erected you know wind turbines it doesn't mean that people have to abseil down turbines and things like that so there's there's all sorts of safety aspects to it that really do appeal to us as a business we're very very big on health and safety as a company on top of that, it's the value added that, that drones bring to the table. You know, the cost reductions as well as the health and safety advantages are absolutely phenomenal in our industry. And that just keeps getting proven and proven time and time again, the more that we use the drones for these various sectors of work. And how big is the, the renewable sector? You mentioned about inspecting wind farms. How, how many kind of other organisations are using drone technology and what are they using it for exactly? Um, to be honest, it's it's still pretty much in its infancy from what we've experienced. But again, there's a lot of people out there who are looking at drones. But what we tend to find in our industry and because we're always technology and, and focused on innovation and progression, what you tend to find is people are a little bit intimidated by something that they don't actually know anything about. And it takes a while for that to filter through and for people to really embrace the technology that is there at their disposal. So, you know, that yeah, the turbines are a fantastic example of using a drone to fly to some serious heights and look at, you know, the detail and damage and potential dangerous um, issues. You know, we've, we've even looked at a turbine that had a lightning strike that was unsafe for anybody to approach it. So that in itself, the technology of drones comes into its own. Uh, you know, you look at solar farms and like I said, you know, there's all sorts of different avenues from renewable energy where you can use a drone in quick time to obtain great levels of data and great levels of detail. So, yeah, it's still evolving. It's evolving every week, every month, every, you know, it's constantly adapting and developing. And we like to try and be at the forefront of that as, as a business and with you guys supporting us as well. Can you give an example of kind of... um? the diversity of your job really how how diverse is is the, your use of the drones that you know is it one day you're down sort of a sewer the next year inspecting a wind turbine 
Yeah, li literally uh, every day is pretty much different. And that's something that as a business we've always loved and we've been very passionate about. So yeah, you've hit the nail on the head when we've spoken before, you know, one day we'll be down a, a sewer looking at um, <laughs> possibly not the most attractive surrounding areas. Uh, the next, you know, we'll be flying through a, a, a an ancient church with beautiful tombstones and stained glass windows. Uh, then, like I said, you'll be on a, a building in the middle of a city centre looking at the condition of the cladding and how the cladding's attached to the building. Is it safe? And then right through to, yeah, being at a turbine, looking at that. And again, just total diversity, even flying in oil refineries. Um, you know, the, the list is endless, really. The diversity that these drones give us and the ability to be diverse is just fantastic in our industry. So no two days are the same. And we're quite happy with that. That's great to hear. And what out of all those has been your your favourite job then? Um, gosh, I, I'm very passionate about everything we do. So it's quite hard to select favourites. I mean, one that I haven't mentioned so far has been environmental surveys. So, for example, anyone who's seen me on LinkedIn or knows of me in general tends to know I'm a bit of a, a an animal mad uh, person. I love nature. I love animals. I love the environment. Uh, you know, we've done inspections in oak trees looking for nesting birds to protect protect them from being basically cut down. Uh, we've looked for fox dens and badger sets for people who are looking at putting fibre cables from one area of a place to another. And we've managed from above without any disruption to these beautiful creatures to validate whether they're there, whether they're not. Are they nesting? Are they breeding? Whatever it may be. So that is something I'm very passionate about. But Again, flying through a church, looking at some of the history in some of these buildings is absolutely astonishing. So it's really hard to pick a favourite. And even being down a sewer, really sad. I actually really love that too. So where do you where do you stop? I could go on forever, Haley, to be quite honest. Brilliant. No, that I think you've just summed it up there that it's just totally diverse and yeah. no one day is the same. Um, so you're not gonna get bored working in the drone no, sector. Definitely not, no. <laughs> Well, um, we'll stick around because we'll get you to do some Q&A at the end. But if we move on to Anna from Raptor UAS, please. Um, Brill, hello, Anna. Hi. Hello again. So just to briefly introduce you again, Anna is MD and drone operator for a company called Raptor UAS. So they provide photography, inspection, surveying and remote access solutions. So not just drones, but would you say drones are becoming quite a big part of what you do? Yeah, well, Raptor actually started uh, on the side of our partner company that is CND Access, where we do mainly remote access works. It ranging from inspection or fabric maintenance and fabrication of all types. So we rapidly see that uh, the drones were definitely the future and we needed to, to implement drones in our inspection. So that's how uh, Raptor started. So as it is now, we are removing that uh, working at height, meet or confined space entry. And instead of doing it as on the ropes, we get the drones to do it for us. So that's how we yeah, how everything started with the uh, Raptor. Talk to me about um, the benefits that you've seen then over traditional methods for inspection. So I know there's always going to be a need for rope access, but how do drones complement uh, traditional methods? For us, it goes definitely it goes uh, hand on hand with the with the traditional rope access inspection because what we normally do is the part of the make sure that we have a safe access to the place we carry out inspections we normally work in like highly industrial um environment we even though we do all kinds of inspections with drones we our background is very solid on, on industry from a refinery to tanker storage um, any kind of infrastructure oil and gas renewables so with our solid background what we do is to try to do the inspections make sure that it's safe actually to access to evaluate their job and to make sure that we are able to assess the scope of work to carry out on a safely manner and on top of that because we are we our team is uh, has a wide range also of inspectors 
and engineers. So we do our own development, development. So we have implemented different inspection agreement into our drone platforms. So we are actually carrying out uh, inspections that are traditional with scope access or with a scaffolding. And now it's the drone, uh, the one who is doing it. So for example, even on broilers, we are doing a lot of inspections just to get the drone inside of LSU that, as you know, is one of my favorites. And just get it on the boilers first, check that if there is any uh, drop objects or anything that it can be a hazard for any people entering the confined space. And after that, we evaluate and we assess the, the safety of, uh, safest way to, to carry out the work. So for anyone listening, um, what Anna's talking about, the, we do sell a drone. Well, we're the only company in the UK to actually supply it but the Elios is a cage drone that can go down pipes and into tanks and things um I know uh Caroline who we spoke to before it's one of her favorite drones to operate um how easy is it Anna to kind of operate these drones especially drones like the Elios 2? Well, for us, it's um, as, as well. We spoke about it before. We are actually uh, partnering up with uh, CND Access again for training. So we do have now the confined space uh, simulator for for flying the Elias and to get actually people trained up. We we found actually that it's very necessary even for ourselves to be trained up because it's not very usual to to fly a drone without seeing it, and that's the main challenge for, for flying the LS2 and also to be able to capture the data, accurate data and also data that you can use and you can provide to a client with the information they require. And then when it comes to using a specialized inspection agreement on the drones, as for example, they will perform ultrasonic thickness measurements with the drone, we need to have like yeah, certain skills to be able to fly the drones, even though the technology is amazing when it comes to it, all the GPS positioning and all even flying yeah up to 15 meters per second wind speeds but it still requires some um, some technique and some skills to fly close to the structures thank you anna i know um we might be able to include it in the follow-up email but there's a brilliant video which is raptor uas has made and it, it's um showcased in their elios 2 indoor flight simulator it looks very cool um, you've got little tunnels mocked up and stuff and basically the pilots just practice flying in there because it's it's quite odd I think to be operating something that you can't see where it's going just like you said. Um, have you got like a favourite project that you've worked on so far Anna and could you tell us a bit about it? For me it's obviously I'm always excited when I'm flying actually and I really like any kind of inspections primarily when we see that we are actually pushing all those traditional or our clients are embracing the new uh, drone technology. For example, we do have a job coming up on a tank. Uh, the, it's an insulated tank, so there is no access on the outside to do any uh, thickness inspection. And inside, even though the tank is empty, we cannot do road access because there is no enough structure actually to, to be suspended from. So our proposal has been, okay, we do it with the drone. So this is going to save just a huge amount of money to our clients and I think they will be like super happy. So for us it's always like something new that we are doing and we are pushing the boundaries of how we carry out inspections. But if I have to pick a favorite one, I would say uh, we do quite a lot of infrastructure dams in particular and because of how big and the location of them they are always very special to to do so it's always on the right and the nature beautiful landscapes and yeah it's a very very nice job to do brilliant yeah as well as being down dirty tunnels and stuff i guess it's nice to get that those scenic shots and things which drones were first known yeah. for yeah mm -hmm. thank you very much um no brilliant. we will move on rapidly to Annabelle from Arcadis. Hello. Hi. So in sort of contrast, you're fairly new to the industry, aren't you? So do you want to talk to us a bit about what's happened so far in the last 12 months? Yeah, so um, Arcadis um, is a 
huge company and we do all sorts of things to do with built assets um, and design consultancy. Um, my team are the environment team, we're called Site Evaluation and Restoration, and our role is to um, provide our clients with information on the ground and groundwater conditions of their site. Um, could be anything from environmental permits, um, contamination risks, um, engineering, so um, looking at soil quality for engineering. Um, so the drone idea sort of came um, sort of at the end of 2019 and we really sort of went for it. This lockdown happened really. So our licenses only came through in November. So we are really, really new to the to the game really. Um, so it's really exciting to hear all of this and see where we can end up in the future actually. How have you found it so far then? So like the, the training that you've had to do, um, getting your hands on like a drone for the first time, operating it, what, what what's it been like? Um, so the training was really good. Obviously, we came in during lockdown, so we had to do it all online. Um, and you guys did a really good job of of creating that online um, facility with the webinars as well. So we sort of had that interaction that um, you sort of don't get like you're in a classroom. Um, flying the drone for the first time, uh, we had these little tiny things that we practiced on just to get the gist of like what the controls do. And then when we suddenly upscaled to our big Matrice, um, <laughs> It was pretty terrifying, but um, there was another colleague who I did it with, and we, we just sort of checked each other, made sure we were observing and keeping a close eye on what we were doing. But it was pretty terrifying, but exciting at the same time. Is this true? I've heard I've not um, operated the Matrice 300 myself or, or any of the Matrice drones, but apparently they're actually fairly easy to use. Would you agree? Yeah, 100%. The software sort of the um, electronics on it that stabilize it in the air are fantastic you can just let it hover and not touch anything um it's sort of we really wanted to make sure we'd practice flying without those aids in case for whatever reason there was a drop um so we were practicing in those um sort of less automatic modes which is a scary bit but it's it's quite straightforward um you've kind of only uh had drones in the business i guess for the last 12 months what are like the feelings and response towards drone technology in, in your organization maybe internally or externally um had so much positive feedback everyone's really excited to see it in action really um so we were postponed a lot with lockdown and weather conditions so we're finally starting to get some really good images to share across our company and share with our clients which is fantastic so everyone's been really really excited we just want to get out there and, and do more stuff with it really and i remember you've spoken to me recently about the the difference between like america and the uk because you've got an Ar arcadis branch um overseas haven't you and how just talk to me how different is it with um, um yeah like, regulations and things yeah so the main difference really is um with a lot of things in america they're not as controlled as they are here um so in america you can pretty much pick up a drone and fly it no matter what um the problems they're facing or the the training that they're being required to do in america may basically comes from their clients so their clients have this due diligence idea and they sort of push the training um, whereas for us, it all comes from the government. That's the real difference. So they are up to standard. They've done all the training, but the the push for that comes from the client point of view rather than from the government, which is quite a big difference. Um, and yeah. the the team in America are a lot a lot bigger and a lot more widespread than we are at the moment. Um, but they were very happy that we finally got through and and done all of our required training. So they're excited yeah. to sort of join us on the journey, really, and help us out. Do you think that um, once you kind of got your two man team up and running, that there's like, can you see scope for it kind of growing from there? Yeah, hundred percent. We've even just had calls today with um, people in other teams within the business because we're so huge and we do so much. Um, we don't sort of get to communicate a huge amount with the other teams a lot of the time. And they've popped up saying, you know, well, we want to get involved in this. So it's something of, we're looking to add pilots from other teams for other other project types as well which is going to be really exciting well um final question have you i know you, you haven't had a huge amount of experience operating the drone but have you had like a favorite kind of moment or a favorite project that you've done so far uh, um 
yeah, as I said, we haven't done a huge amount yet, but um, what I've really enjoyed seeing is like the outputs that you can get. So we did some training on a, a local site when we were just when we were practicing taking various images and stuff, and we ended up putting that visualization of the site into virtual reality, so you could be on the site but not be on the site, which is just really incredible to see and a great use of like future technology, which is really exciting. So that's something that I found pretty pretty cool. Absolutely. I think as the industry grows, things like AI and stuff and will just become like the norm, which is just crazy to think. Brill, um, if you could stick around for the Q&A, that would be great. But we Thank will you. move on to Caroline from Pictera. Hi, Hayley. Hello. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thanks. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to to join in today because I know you're supposed to be skiing down a mountain aren't you or maybe you're doing that yeah, earlier. I don't know if you can see some chalets outside I'm in the mountains in Switzerland so yeah I was doing that earlier but all good nice to speak with you now so uh, great great panelists so far really interesting observations. Absolutely um, and I guess you, you heard me before mention that the reason we kind of had the idea for this was because of the previous um, webinar that you'd done with Randall which exactly yeah um so randall's a well uh, was a partner when i used to work for pix4d and he worked still works at FLIR, and now i would say a good friend and, and colleague in general so it was a pleasure to be invited to that forum and some great lady speakers there and the whole point of that actually was because he'd done an all men uh, panel two weeks prior to that and got quite a bit of kickback from the ladies in the industry saying you having a unmanned um <laughs> discussion that's only men and so yeah. we had a ladies one yeah but i think uh, i think you're doing really well to to follow in his footsteps i know he sends his best regards today oh, well yeah i think the phrase was this, someone had said to him it's the most manned panel that they'd ever seen i said like. that oh, yeah. <laughs> i think other people did too quotes caroline <laughs> So could you kick off, please, just telling me a bit about your story so far? You know, how did you get into Pix4D and then how are you kind of at Pixera now? Right. Yeah. So I'm coming at this from more the software point of view today. I don't use or sell drones myself, but I've been in the drone industry now for five years selling software, which is complementary to drone users. Um, so my background is as a civil engineer. I have a master's in civil engineering and a PhD in hydraulic engineering. I moved, did an about turn into the commercial world when I moved to Switzerland and ended up selling software to engineers. So that was how I entered the sphere. Um, but I have to say, I love it. And it's a really rewarding industry to be in also because it's brand new. So, um, well, relatively new. So I'm seeing everything grow um, year on year and that's great. Um, so yes, I used to work for Pix4D, I now work for Pictera. So Pictera is a machine learning software which allows you to input images and train it. It's, it's AI, as you were just mentioning, to pull out things that you repetitively need to find from drone images or author mosaics or larger images which are stitched together maps of drone images. So you can do that using Pictera, you can stitch together images using Pix4D or make 3D models using Pix4D, that's who I, I used to work for. And there's other providers out there as well. So I think this is an interesting aspect to anybody that wants to start using drones or implementing drones into their workflow, because really the drone takes an image, but what it is that you want the image for? That would be my question. And that's where the software has come in. And I think, Pictera, for example, it's used for counting things, counting trees, counting buildings. It's used for finding things and highlighting the vectors. So edges of roads, edges of buildings, edges of areas that were burned by wildfires or flooded so that you can pull those out and put them into further software that you use for design work or for um, yeah, monitoring assets. A lot of people are using it with ArcGIS Pro, which is the Esri suite, for example. Well, that's you've summed it up very well. Could you explain? Um, you kind of alluded to it then with um, you know, looking at forest areas and particularly um after natural disasters and things like this. Um, what are can you give some examples of um where the software has come in use for sort of natural disasters or otherwise? Yeah. Um. 
natural disasters are by definition an emergency so you need very fast data so historical data that's existed of a site just isn't useful i mean it's useful for seeing where roads were or houses were but maybe they're not there anymore and it doesn't help you see things like trees falling across roads so you can't get to people who are in trouble it doesn't help you see which areas are flooded if you're an insurance company and some farmer is asking for crop insurance to be paid out because they've lost half of their field so those are all things or situations in which you would need very quick up-to-date visual information hence drone images brilliant you can get them really quickly within hours of it happening assume you assuming you can fly in the weather then software stitches together images or it pulls out the main things that you're looking for so that you can very quickly make an assessment um, and use those images usefully so the images themselves are probably already useful to see what kind of damage or level of damage you're looking for like have uh, roofs been blown off houses have trees been blown over how much of the city approximately looks like it's flooded but you're actually going to need an overall map and you're going to need to save layers of that data for future reference so when court cases come or that when um this is analysed in the future to see why so much flood water rushed into the middle of that city within six hours. You have data for those things and you can pull them up and use them again. So those would be examples of why um, images from drones and also data analysis software are really becoming key for uh, emergency services and humanitarian mm -hmm. efforts too. Absolutely. I would say that we have a big problem with flooding in this country and I have seen before, I can't remember the name of the dam, but um, I've seen lots of footage of um, when they were using it to basically work out how long they had before they had to evacuate the village that was in front of it. So it's got all kinds of use cases. Just to finish, before we move on to the next panellist, could you just summarise quite quickly, um, what do you love about working in the drone industry? There's so many things you can do with drones. It's amazing. I mean, we've heard about the Elios 2, that's the one in the cage from flyability that flies inside of pipes and tanks. There's uh, fixed wing ones from SenseFly, Wingtra, and they can cover large areas if you're doing crop analysis or looking, you know, huge quarries or large sites or doing corridors of train, train lines or motorways. You've got the, the smaller copters if you want to um, do inspection of single houses or small areas and then you've got all of the payloads so you've got the FLIR thermal cameras you've got the phase one uh, 100 megapixel cameras for really detailed work you've got the uh, microsense multi-spectral cameras there's a lot of things that can be achieved with drones and the payloads and then you've got multiple softwares do you want to count things do you want to pull out vectors do you want to report to share with clients um, do you want a, a screen that you can share and use with your clients to make annotations about problem points that you're seeing on the site on a daily basis? All of these things are becoming possible to people that don't need like a uh, long education in these things anymore. You can take courses, you can get up to scratch in a matter of weeks. That's exciting to me and uh, it's great hearing all the user cases from your panellists today. Yes, it, exactly. As you said, it's just so diverse we couldn't even fit in the amount that you, you could talk about with the drone industry could you but we've we've tried um thank you very much caroline um we'll move on to naomi who's one of our internal team at copters um if she will appear very soon there we go <laughs> Hello, could you just start off explaining exactly what you sort of do at Copters, how you fell into the drone sector? Yeah, so as I say, I've been here for three years, so I only started in the drone sector three years ago, so I am relatively new myself. Um, so I'm moving into the training department at Copters, um, so mainly focusing on arranging um, training courses, arranging flight tests, which over the past year has proven a bit of a challenge given COVID, but you know, we've managed to overcome it and get 
got a lot of people through, um, issued a lot of certificates to people um, through the PFCO and just started um, this year with the A2 CFC. Um, so just mainly looking at people's um, documentation that they send in and doing, you know, kind of checks on that and just making sure everyone gets the best experience out of us uh, courses. You mentioned the, the drone regulations, which I'm sure a lot of people who are on the webinar now, if you're already in the drone sector, you'll have known that the regulations changed um, last year. So there's been a lot of kind of catching up for not just all of the drone service providers, but even people who are doing the training like us. Can you just talk about how, how has it impacted you and people in the UK? Yeah, I think it's been a big change for everyone, to be honest. Just a, a bit of confusion for everyone to get their head around. Um, and I know internally we we had to wrap his head around the changes that came into place and moving from the PFCO to the A2 CFC. Towards the end of last year, we had a big rush of just getting everyone through um, pushing them through to make sure that they could, um, you know, apply for the PFCO before the deadline. So that was quite exciting, um, you know, helping everyone, just making sure that they, they push through basically. But it, it, it's been a big adjustment um, for us to get us head around. But, you know, I think we've smashed it with webinars and just helping people get their head around it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have had a question today from a lady called Elaine. I think I've seen her in the attendees. So um, her question is, are there any specific courses and qualifications that she should be looking at that allow for like commercial work in the UK? Um, I would just say uh, the the new regulation courses that we've touched upon, we, you know, we do the, the A2 CFC and the GVC course. Um, so it just depends on the type of aircraft that you're flying. Um, and just touch upon that and, um, you know, look into which course is best for, for the drone. And then finally, what advice would you give to drone operators to ensure they're following best practice and they're not breaking any laws or breaking any rules um, and they're protecting like their aircraft? Yeah, so I would say the, the best advice is to um, sign up to Skywise um, because that ensures that you're always getting updated on any changes to regulations from the CAA as and when they happen so you're receiving that information straight away and you're keeping up to date with the changes um, I would say as soon as those changes come in update your operations manual um, and make sure that you're updating that throughout the year not just when it comes to renewal um, so it's not just a mad rush to make the changes um, and also just make sure that you've got the right insurance in place when you're flying. Insurance is very important, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, one more question, sorry. Uh, Susan has asked, are there many women out of interest doing the training? So online or flight tests and things? Yeah, definitely. I mean, since I've started um, three, three years ago, as I say, I've definitely seen more and more women um, come through the course and it's just become more and more popular for women to come into the industry and want to learn. So I would say that, you know, we are getting equal with men doing the course and women um, because it is just so popular nowadays. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Naomi. Um, I, I'm sure everyone's sick of my voice now. So we're going to move on to the lovely Jess, who's in the marketing team at Coptus. Hi, Jess. Hello. And Rebecca. Yes. So, hi, Rebecca. Hi. Hi. Um, so, firstly, do you just want to give us an overview of what iProServe do and what your role is in the drone industry? Yeah, so iProServe, we are a national um, supply chain of drone operators. Um, we facilitate on demand inspections to predominantly the insurance sector and various other industries. Um, we use remote operators, um, so we do varying different types of inspections from um, some, some of the ladies have mentioned the different types of crafts in terms of the Elios, the M300, um, varying different types of crafts in terms of the different types of inspections that we um, undertake on a daily basis. 
Oh, lovely. Amazing. Um, so obviously you're a business entrepreneur. Um, how did you end up in drone surveying? So we founded the business in 2014. Um, my, my husband at the time, the business is um, majority owned by myself and my husband. Um, Shane came home with a drone. Um, DJI had just launched the Phantom drone um, to the um, public. Um, he, sh he was using it for his own business, um, which was in um, property Spain at the time. And he showed me some uh, flyovers um, of the actual drone um, over a village. Um, I, at the time, worked in financial services. Um, I have done for 18 years, and I experienced the floods in 2007 in South Yorkshire. I instantly kind of had that light bulb moment in terms of when there is a catastrophic event in terms of an insurer, um, everybody's hands on deck, adjusters are out trying to um, get policyholders into a place, alternative accommodation, um, starting the remedial works. Um, and I just thought there is a different way that insurers can manage this type of um, situation or cat uh, catastrophic event. We then kind of put the business proposal together and um, we did the research in terms of to operate commercially in um, the world of drones. You needed to have a permission from the CAA, so we went down the road of um, obtaining our permission for aerial work at the time. We then um, had the hard slog of convincing the insurance sector um, to um, adapt drones, because obviously insurance is very um, conservative. But once we got our first client, um, we got our first case study. Um, it was a case of um, just promoting it to um, other businesses um, and other stakeholders. Amazing. So you obviously, you mentioned you've, you've been in the industry for um, six years now. So have you experienced kind of any changes over that time if you kind of starting to now and would you like to kind of go into that? Yeah, this week, I suppose uh, looking at the industry six years ago, when we was um, initially talking to clients, there was a lot of um, education to be done and just kind of educating them around that drones were regulated by the Civil Aviation Authority. You did need um, permission to operate in a commercial capacity. Um, I think more so now it's more of a demand um, from clients, um, just generally. But I think that's more of a testament. Um, the light bulb switching on to various different stakeholders, um, customers, and that's due to what the drone operators, the remote operators are doing on a day-to-day -day basis in, in terms of the fantastic work that they're doing, in terms of moving the industry forward. Um, the demand, um, it, it's great. We, we get um, varying different types of inspection requests and we're always challenged by our clients, which is, a, which is obviously um, a lovely thing. I think from our, the industry point of view, if we absolutely get it right, I think we could collaborate more in terms of commercial businesses um, together to move the industry forward. And I think if we do that collectively, we will then start to grow the industry, a strong industry moving forward. And from a public's per uh, perception point of view, um, they will be more um, adopted to drones. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so finally, sorry, just to kind of rush on, I know that we're a bit short on time today. Is there anything that you've experienced as your time as a female in the industry? that you kind of, it stands out and you thought like, wow, like I am a woman in, in a very male dominated sector? I think honestly, nothing serious, but in the early days, um, I think it was very much of um, drones, our technology and being a woman in the industry, it's kind of how can a woman lead a technology company um, and more so because the drones are relatively new. Um, they did kind of take that approach in terms of when you were um, talking about the regulations surrounding drones, it was kind of a little bit of a thing of what does that woman know about drones and regulations? We kind of know a little bit more type of thing. Um, they all predominantly wanted to speak to my husband, who is the co-founder. But I think over time it's becoming less common. Um, I'm not saying at all it doesn't exist. 
but it's less of an issue than uh, when we started out. I think also we've built the brand reputation as well along the way. Um, but if we look at some of the ladies working in the industry, um, you've got the UAV unit, um, head of the uh, unmanned aerial systems at the, the CAA, that's headed up by um, SOFE. Um, that's obviously a very influential role um, that one, and she's going to help shape this industry moving forward in years to come. And it's great to see that it's been headed up um, by a woman. So we really need to keep focusing, promoting the good work that um, that women that we are doing um, in the industry and generally in business. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that that is a great way to kind of round off. Um, thank you, Rebecca, um, for welcome. your time. So what we'll do now is I'll be moving on. I'll be talking to Emily from Drone Prep. Oh. Hi, Emily. How are you? Hi, I'm good, thank you. How are you? No, it's been really interesting to listen to everyone else and learning all about what they do. Women power. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, so do you just quickly want to kind of go into what you do in the drone sector and what Drone Prep is all about? Yes, yeah, so I'm the Innovation Lead and Community Manager at Drone Prep, and really the company's kind of split into two parts. You have the software side, which the amazing CTO Claire Owen works on, and that's all about helping from the hobbyist community identify where they can, can and can't fly. So we've mapped all 56 million land parcels, and they can click on any parcel and see the landowner's terms and conditions of flight. I'm not going to say too much on that part because the launch is next week on our new platform. So hopefully you'll see that shared around everywhere and everyone can log on and find out what it's all about. And then my side, I work with Gareth on all the innovation projects, like the Isle of Mall project, it's overall mail, the Isle of Sydney Medical Air Bridge. We just try to bring the best and the biggest in the industry to make Drones for Good happen. Yeah, so exciting. It's so lovely to have Drones for Good. Um, yes. So kind of winding back a bit, uh, you did a, you uh, got a first class degree in geography um, and you did your studies on UAVs, didn't you, if I'm, if I'm correct. Do you want to kind of go into that and, and where that all came from? Yes, yeah, so I have to say until university happened, I had no idea about drones and that I wanted to get into drones. And it kind of happened in my first year at university. I went out to Lakeside Campus. I'm, I was at University of Worcester. And James Atkins, who was like the GIS whiz, kind of put a drone in the sky and did a demonstration with it. And I remember looking at my friend Josie and was like, that's pretty cool. We can use drones to complement our curriculum and it helped the real world. Like it kind of just all floated in my head and then got caught from first year and then fast forward into my second year. Professor Ian Maddock did a demonstration in the mountain environments module where they collected imagery from the Arola Valley and we pieced it all together and created a DEM. So that's a digital elevation model. And it's like a 3D model. And I was just like, now that is cool. And from that point, I was honestly hooked. So I just tried to get as much experience as I can while I was at university in poor and could offer my services for free. So I like did a placement at Geodyne where I did the stock, stock surveys for Hanson. I created resources with Josie Lynch and Holly Willis on the CAA drone code to get other students prepared for work and life in the UAVs. And I just tried to do as much as physically possible in such a short amount of time to land me at where I am today. <laughs> Sounds like a huge, huge project. Um, so talking of projects that you've worked on, you completed the Royal Mail's first ever drone delivery on the Isle of Mull, um, which yeah. is crazy. So would you like to look, go a little bit more into that? Yes, that was kind of a whirlwind event, I have to say, where we kind of brought in what three words, Skyports, Drone Prep, and obviously Royal Mail at the back end of 2020. And I remember when the press release first went out, what three words said it had 111 million clicks in the first 24 hours. So for me, that was just mind-blowing and the project it has four phases and at the back end of last year that was the first phase and just encapsulating it all in one about what we're all about so drone prep are doing the consultation with all the residents landowners stakeholders on the Isle of Mall to basically see do you like drones do you want delivery because if they don't have to have it if they don't want to and if they're receptive to this drone delivery we're encouraging residents to come onto our platform and log on where they want their drone deliveries to be and when they do that that will be with the what three words three by three meters of squares and then when that's all done, Skyport's then going to wrap it all up by doing del drone deliveries to the locations that we've chosen. So it's going to be a really cool project when it's all finished. <laughs> so exciting it is, it's great. Um, so just finally, Emily, we're really pressed for time at the minute. Um, so <laughs> in as short of a way that you can, what advice would you give to kind of young females wanting to enter the industry? God, there's so much, but I think as when you enter any industry, you have to have confidence in yourself, back yourself, because if you don't back yourself, how's your employer and other people going to believe in you? But then I think 
what I've really found is connections in the industry. So just connect them with link people on LinkedIn, even if they say no, what they're going to do. You learn from them, you learn where you want to go, you can kind of learn from their experiences. And as well as that, you make friends in the industry. So as a woman, it can kind of be a bit lonely. So like I met Bethany from Copters and all of you lovely people, like just connecting people and sharing your interests, it kind of makes it all a bit worthwhile. And I think if you can do that while building on your experience, I can't see where it go wrong. Absolutely. No, I would completely agree. All right, Emily, thank you so much for your time. It's been lovely to speak to you today. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. All right. What I will do is I will pass you back to Hayley. If Hayley's there at the moment, I think it's time to just look over the training. Cool. Um, cool. So very quickly, because I want to leave as much time at the end for Q&A as possible, because I know that's what everyone is here for, is to speak and hear from the panel. Um, but very briefly, we have drone training in the at Copters Academy. Um, at the moment, we've got a free A2 CFC course, so it's no charge at all to do the online training. We only asked for like a £49 plus VAT for the exam fee at the end. Um, we also got a special offer on um, anyone who wants to do the GVC. So that's the course where you'd need it to kind of fly maybe the larger aircraft or you, you've got projects in mind which are slightly more complex. Um, speak to the sales team if you're not sure which one you're going to need because they'll be able to advise you based on your kit but the offer is 50% off for everybody who's on the panel um, until the end of March so um, you can use the coupon code women50 or speak to the sales team and they'll be able to hook you up. Uh, next please Jess. I think we're going into the Q&A now so if the panel would like to switch their webcams back on that would be great so it's just not my face on the screen lovely um, we have had quite a few questions come in already um, the one that i found the most interesting and i'd like to start off with is from uh shah who's tuning in i think it's from um san francisco which is i didn't realize this webinar would stretch that far but there you go um the question is so She's a professional photographer who'd like to transition into drone piloting in the US, but her background is in the creative space. She's interested in disaster, humanitarian inspections, but she's not sure what steps to take to get into that. And could I go to Caroline Bailey first for that question, please? Yeah, sure. Hi, Shah. Thanks for your question. I would ask if you wanted to become a photographer or actually make models of these disasters or what you were trying to pull out with the drone photographs. Because I think taking photographs, um, there's, there's various different drones that could be most suitable for that. Um, but if you actually want to analyze the site after an event, um, then there's two things you could do. I mean, I've worked with two different software companies. They could both help. Um, one example we had with Pictera recently was counting um, tarpaulins that have been put over roofs that had blown off and they're bright blue so it's very easy to see them and count them from from drone images so that was one thing that was done I know in Pix4D there were many examples of making larger maps with um, with their software so you can see the area in a matter of hours and have it in one big picture by stitching together the drone images so I'd say look into those two solutions and decide what it is you actually want to achieve as a result of using a drone in those scenarios. We have another question from Valentine. So Valentine's rounding up her PhD in visual culture and wants to take up a drone course to get into heritage and social impact assessment. Um, would Jess and Caroline be able to give any example of industries that would employ um, Valentine after these? Does that make sense? I'm Should we give that? Sorry, Hayley? Emily, if that makes probably more sense to you. So basically she's rounding off in a PhD in visual culture for heritage and social impact assessment could you give her any advice on the types of industries she might work in after that? I think you're oh, muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. 
personally, I haven't worked in heritage, but just like what I said before, I'd never worked in drone deliveries or anything like that. I didn't even know they existed until I met drone prep. So just by connecting with people, if you do keyword searches on all social media and type in heritage, drones, all these people that will have so much more knowledge than me on that will just pop up and it will just be so helpful. And if I can tune into any of my network, I have so many leading researchers from like Cost Action Harmonious, they probably know so much more about stuff like that, that than me. I can help tune you in. <laughs> From my perspective, Hayley, just to add to that, it's Caroline from Networks 3. Um, we've obviously looked at various sort of different types of heritage buildings, but what we've tended to have is either private clientele come to us through reputation, but also work with local authorities, you know, speak to people who have access to these premises, who have listed buildings, who have interest in preservation of these buildings. So again, Emily's made a great point, network, get, get to know people because sometimes word of mouth and reputation precedes us, um, but definitely working with local authorities in whatever your background is, is always beneficial in that area. So just keep connecting with people. Um, and again, because drones are sometimes not the, the first thing people think about still, it, it's us that need to get out there and, and make them known. So just keep connecting constantly and, and use people in your network to, to grow basically. Absolutely, I completely agree. And on the sort of thread of um, reputation in the industry, we've got a great comment in from Annette. She said, everyone in here loves the drones and the drone industry, obviously, because we all work in it. Unfortunately, the public image of drones and its users are often very negative in the media, um, mainly depicting drones as being a nuisance, etc. What do you think is needed to improve the public image of drones and its users? I loved what Caroline said about how drones can be used and why she is so passionate about the industry. That's exactly the attitude we need to spread. So um, should we kick off with Caroline um, Bailey on that one, please, just because it was named? Yeah, sure. Um, it's a very good point. I think, first of all, drones were associated with the military. I mean, they're still used in the military, and that's very different to what we're talking about today. Second, the kind of drones we're talking about today are reported when there's nuisance cases like Gatwick Airport. No one's going to forget that quickly. So these are negative examples. We need more. Um, we have plenty of examples of positive cases, so I think it's a matter of getting them out there. And actually, there are loads out there. It's probably a matter of getting them to the right channels, you know. But just this week on, oh, sorry, last week on BBC News, there was an example of, well, it was satellite images being used to count elephants for a nature um, conservation project. I mean, that's a different kind of imagery, but that's the kind of thing we need to see more and in mainstream media like that. We've done that with drone images. You can look at flood effects with drone images. You can count fallen trees. You can count refugee tents. You can do so many things that are kind of big, big name, sexy projects. And those are really good for media because they catch attention. What's kind of more difficult to get into the media is the mundane work. What I actually think is one of the greatest uses of drones. And that's things like, looking in sewers or counting cracks in roads or um, making an itinerary of street furniture that's owned by the council so has to be inventorized but has never been digitized all of those things are now being done and they'll never stop needing to be done like maintenance of buildings and roads and dams and bridges will continuously continuously be needed to be done and i think just continuing the conversation about how drones can help with those projects um, and making people aware that these are tools, they're not toys, um, that that will be how we get it out there. So let's just keep talking about it, keep posting, even if it sounds a bit boring. If people are doing it, other people should know. Yes, completely agree. I saw, Emily, you were nodding your head quite a lot. Have you got anything to add? It's just kind of the whole thing of what drone prep's about is just educating the community. And I just think it's this massive education piece of just telling people most often drones aren't there to spy on you. Like we go down to so many stately homes and landowners and they're like, I hate drones, they're there, they're pestering on me, they're looking through my windows. And we just go, I promise you the hobbyist community aren't there to spy on you. They just don't know that sometimes they can't fly there or the boundaries to have. So I think when you educate them on that, they're like, oh, okay. And on, just on the commercial side, this whole push for drones for good, like the transporting of medical supplies by sky ports up in the Isle of Mole and the Agron Butte region, just that whole movement is just shown to people Oh, drones are actually coming into our day-to-day -day lives they can be really good it's an education piece and I think 
what really sunk it in for me was my parents, they hate drones, they have nothing to do with it, they don't know what I'm doing in the industry. And this whole drone displays over New Year's Eve kind of just made them think, whoa, they're coming into the, the area, they know what they're talking about, and now they're putting all their drone stories out in the world. And I think if you educate in a way that people can understand and they know what you're talking about, you're going to get through to people rather than just ramming it down the throats. <laughs> Absolutely. I think that um, drone firework kind of display just made it as a very easy way to digest the technology and it's making it into a positive thing, a nice thing. Um, we've got a question for Annabelle. Do you think it's difficult for women to get into the drone industry, particularly uh, in the surveying sector? Um, it's not difficult if, as we've said before, if you back yourself and you think you've got you know you, you've got the um the capabilities and the sort of drive for it then it shouldn't be difficult um in the surveying industry I'm not so clued up on sort of I've been quite like I've only been involved in my company um as a surveyor I guess the surveying industry is quite male dominated as it is however there's no reason it shouldn't be for females as well um so if, you, if that's what you want to do go for it like there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to do it at all absolutely we've got quite a funny comment here from um jennifer who's also in the us she says she's interested to find out about what it's like operating in the uk and has anyone figured out how to make the wind stop blowing um i don't know anna if you've got any kind of maybe turning it into a more of a factual thing um what kind of drone equipment can deal with windy conditions in the uk well for me i could say i'm very happy with uh, using the dji mp10 or the m300 that's just like nice and steady easy to to use so i would really i haven't had any issues with them even on windy conditions very windy conditions it is sometimes the problem you have is that they actually the images if you are doing visual inspection they are not very good because even though the gimbal are fantastic you, you don't yeah you can don't compensate for the high wind so sometimes it's just better not to not to risk it yeah absolutely um i think people have been quite surprised how well some of those dji drones deal with the wind and also you've got the the parrot and Nafi usa which has got very high ip rating so can deal with um water and light rain we have another question for caroline bailey seems very popular today um you explain that there are drones that can fly over large areas and used for flying along motorways i thought it wasn't possible to fly along motorways due to restrictions or flying close to cars vehicles etc it's true in d in different cases there are lots of restrictions you should always check those out so generally over crowds or moving vehicles like working motorways and train lines but in uh, th that case i meant while roads are being constructed so then then it's you're you're able to i mean always check <laughs> disclaimer but wow. yes that's the kind of thing that these and i'm talking about fixed wing drones so those are the ones shaped like birds like sensefly or winter uh, drones they can they can cover much longer distances and larger areas in general so those would be the drones i recommend for large scale mapping um then your copters like the the multi-copters would be more for smaller areas single buildings poles things that you know you want to go up and down the side of a of a down wall or something like that it's dependent on the battery life so the the fixed wing drones can fly for longer effectively and because they go straight and turn around and come back like that they can just cover large distances rather than having to be moved slightly like copters are to to check small small things in uh, in facades thank you caroline um, question for everyone. Um, I'm not going to select, so if anyone wants to speak up, I know no one can see Caroline, but I'm sure she's dying to say something. Um, what are the biggest mistakes you've seen people make in your each of your industries? I love how you've uh, pitched me for this one, Hayley. <laughs> um, oh gosh. Um, 
Biggest mistakes? Well, I think I'll stick with the theme of what we're discussing, which is women in drones, really. So I think the biggest mistake people make is having less belief in the self because they are a woman. And also the bigger mistake is people believing that women can't achieve what anybody else can achieve in this industry and any other industry that we all function in. So I've actually not done any kind of discussion that centers around women in industries. I've actually deliberately, funnily enough, avoided that up until this point because I've always sort of, I've always seen myself as equal and always believed myself to be equal and never really questioned that. But this really stood out to me because I still to this day get people who ring up about drone inquiry and say, oh, I'll speak to so-and-so instead of you. And ironically, I, with the people in Networks 3 Drones, you know, started the drone side of our business up and we advanced it together. And ironically, know as much as anybody else does, potentially more in some cases, but sometimes people do still make that assumption that maybe you don't because you are a woman. And that's really sad. And that's not something that I tend to talk about very openly because I don't like to be seen as trying to be too much of a feminist in this industry. But it is a big mistake and we're here to sort of prove otherwise. And I admire every person on this webinar. I admire everyone who's tuned in to actually listen to the people on this webinar. And I think we all need to move forward and look at technology and its positives, not based on gender or anything other than the fact that technology is there to basically be an addition to all our working lives and be a positive to that regardless of gender or any other aspect so that to me being subject specific is what the biggest mistake is in this industry in general thank you very much caroline um i think that's actually a very good place to leave it um so thank you very much to all of our panel. I have got a request here from Charlotte. She says, is it okay if she connects with everyone on LinkedIn who's on the panel? I'm sure you're all happy with that. Yep, yeah, thumbs up. Um, just to finish off, um, yes, there's gonna be a recording. Anyone who's still listening, um, you can forward, you know, record back this and watch it again at a later date. Um, we have got another all day webinar next Tuesday. So it's going to be back to back with um, Pete, who's leading it. It's all about starting in the drone industry from a complete beginner. So you've got um, becoming a drone pilot, uh, learning to build a successful drone business. We've got an inspection sector one, uh, public safety, surveying media industry and then LCAS. LCAS is anyone who's leaving the military and they can put their credits towards drone training at Copters. Um, finally, thank you very much for joining. Uh, thank you for the panel. It's been really interesting. And yeah, that's it from me. Thanks everyone. It's been great. Thank you for putting it together. Thank, thank you for you. having me. Oh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks Bye. everyone. Okay.